So uh, we're going to be talking tonight about um, validation. And I've taken this, of course, from Steve Blank. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this uh, picture many times before. Um, Steve positions customer validation, as he calls it, customer validation, as the second of four stages in creating a startup. Uh, it takes place in this framework after customer discovery has occurred. And what happens, as you know, at the end of customer discovery is you believe you have a scalable um, and reliable business model. You believe you have one. Why do you believe that? You believe it because you have been talking to a lot of people, hundreds of people perhaps, as you go through customer discovery. And the purpose of that talking is to test your hypotheses in terms of the business model. Uh, and if the hypotheses are correct, then you leave them. If they're not, and they usually aren't, at least to start with, then you change them. And you iterate that process until uh, you've, uh, you've validated all of your hypotheses. But again, you've validated them by talking with people. And as you know, that talking process is deliberately not a sales effort. You haven't really tried to sell anybody anything during the customer discovery uh, stage. So you're now at the point where you think you have a scalable, repeatable business model, and it's time to test that as well. So we'll be talking tonight about that testing process. Uh, we'll describe it as four steps, and we'll talk about each step uh, as we go. Um, but I'm going to begin by talking about a couple of examples uh, where customer validation was not done and what the consequences of, of that were, just to get us in the right sort of frame of mind for the importance of customer validation. Now, I'm very happy to have questions as we go along, and there's formal time set aside at the end for Q&A, and that's great. But if you have a question as we go, please just raise your hand and, uh, and we'll address it. So these two examples um, both come from articles in the Fin Review. Uh, one was published about three months ago, and one was just published yesterday, as a matter of fact, very timely uh, for, for this event tonight. The Fin Review is running a series of articles on startups that have near-death experiences. And we owe a lot to the entrepreneurs who are willing to tell their stories uh, in, for, for that series of articles. Now, the, I'll, uh, this is a, a spoiler alert. Uh, the two stories that I'm going to tell tonight have happy endings, uh, but both of them were a very, very close thing. So let's talk first of all about one you may have heard of, and that's Yum Table. So Yum Table is a system for uh, booking re uh, restaurant tables. You can think of it as being like Dimmy. Uh, one difference with Dimmy, um, and you, you may not be able to see this so clearly on the slide, is that very often the restaurants on Yum Table are offering a deal. So if you could see that slide more clearly, uh, it would say you can have $45 off at this restaurant or you can have $30 off at that restaurant and so on. Just click here, book the table, and you, and you get the discount. Now, when Yum Table was conceived, uh, the entrepreneur who put it together thought, um, if the customer is getting a discount, uh, surely the customer should be willing to pay something to use the system. So Demi was built on the basis uh, that cu the customer would pay. And when that uh, customer discovery process was done, people were asked, so if you were offered $50 off, let's say, at a restaurant by using this app, would you be willing to pay $5? And people said, basically, sure, of course, that's a great deal. I'm paying $5, but I'm getting 50, so I'm way ahead of that, I'm, I'm gonna do that. So without any further validation, uh, Dimmy spent nine months building the app, um, hired a sales force, the sales force went, up, went out and started signing up restaurants, uh, the process played out, uh, the app was launched, uh, and in the first month they didn't get very many customers. Uh, and in the second month they didn't get very many customers. Uh, and in the third month they didn't get very many customers. And after that, the entrepreneur called everyone together and said, this isn't working. Customers are not in fact willing to pay to use this app. Even if they're getting $50, they're not willing to pay five. So what they told us is not the way they're behaving. So we've got to pivot. 
And the pivot is the restaurants have to pay. So the customer can use it free, but the restaurants have to pay. At that meeting, half the sales force quit on the spot. They said, look, we've been out for three months signing up restaurants. We told them that they would never, ever have to pay, cross, you know, hand on heart, uh, they wouldn't have to pay. And now you want us to go back to them and tell them, well, we've changed our mind. Uh, you do have to pay after all. We won't do it. So half the sales force walked out the door on the spot. Half the restaurants quit after they were told that uh, they had to pay. The app, of course, had to be completely rebuilt uh, because it had been built on the basis that the, that the uh, customer was going to pay, and now that was going to be reversed. Uh, so Dimmy went through a very tough time. I, I had the, the entrepreneur who started this as an, a Monash graduate. I asked him to come and talk to my class at Monash about it, and it was clear that it had been a narrow thing uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the organization surviving. But it did survive. Uh, it's, it's back. Uh, the app now works on the basis that the restaurant pays. You can still get a good deal on Dimmy, uh, and it worked. So we might just pause. I, I won't pose the question formally now, but just might pause and reflect. Why is it that people didn't act as they say they would? They, they said they would do it. The customer discovery process played out. The, the business model looked fine. But when it came down to it, they wouldn't, not in any substantial numbers. Yeah, let's think about that. Now, here's the one that was in the paper just yesterday. This is the clipping. User pays, puts paid to promising concept. This is an entrepreneur called Mark Mendel. In 2007, Mark set out to disrupt buying apartments off the plan. He said to himself in 2007, this is crazy. Developers are building apartments uh, in Sydney and Brisbane and Melbourne in, in great numbers. And they hire people or use real estate agents to sell those apartments off the plan. That's crazy. Um, buyers, uh, buyers should be able to buy directly online. So you should be able to go online, find a development that you like, find an apartment that you like, and buy it online without, paying, without anybody paying an agent. That was, the, that was his principle. Huh? And in order to get people, developers on board, he offered them a free trial. He said, you can use it free. And they said, fine, they listed their apartments. Things started going really well. It was working in Melbourne and Brisbane and in Sydney. Uh, in 2008, Mark said to the, to the developers, well, you've had a good run. Uh, you've had a free trial. And now I'd like to convert you to paid basis. And uh, Mark's plan was that 80% of the developers would convert from free to paid. In fact, 90% of them walked away. 90% of them wouldn't pay him anything to list their apartments on the website. Uh, what they wanted him to do was to hire agents. And Mark said to them, it's in the story, no, 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 you don't, get what I, you don't get this. I'm trying to do away with the agents. I'm trying to disrupt this industry, not act like the industry. Uh, so there was a little bit of discussion. Here's the first company that Mark founded. This is the one, was called, it's called Marsh. The website is still there, but the company isn't doing what it what it once did. It isn't selling uh, apartments um, off the plan online, and it isn't because the developers wouldn't pay for it. They wouldn't pay to list their, their units online. And again, we might think about why is it they were willing to pay agents commissions? Why is it they were willing to pay for leads and for sales, but they weren't willing to pay to simply list the units online? Okay. So Mark w went through uh, not just one pivot, but three. He couldn't decide what business model to use next. So he tried one model in Brisbane, one model in Sydney, and one model in Melbourne. And he figured out of the three, surely one of these was going to work out. And indeed, one did. Uh, and the one that did is now in this uh, site, I buy new. You can buy an apartment off the plan, but you don't do the transaction online. You indicate your interest, you call them on the phone, and somebody talks you through the process. So the sale process is actually carried out sort of voice to voice by someone who works uh, for Mark in, uh, in this new business. Um, now, the good news story here is that last year, this new company made $600,000 worth of profit. Um, and uh, this year, Mark sold half of it to somebody else. So again, near-death experience. Uh, Mark said he was, he was running around like a headless chook when he had those three business models going, uh, but eventually one, one hit, 
and this is the one that hit. So happy ending to a difficult story. And we might reflect again, why is it that people didn't act the way they said they were going to act? All right, so why is it that, this hap that these things happen? People say one thing, and then they do something else. Well, here's the short story. Customers lie, right? Customers lie. Some customers lie knowingly and deliberately, um, not maliciously. But they lie for a number of sort of clear reasons. One, they just want to get rid of you. You're asking, you're out there doing customer discovery, they just want you to go away. They don't want to be rude, they just want you to go away. So they tell you, yeah, yeah, it's great, fantastic, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Stake my life on it, great. Or they don't want to hurt your feelings because you're a friend or you're a family member or just you seem like a, a, a nice person. And they somehow believe that it's better to mislead you than it is to tell you the truth, okay? But Customers lie, that's the first thing. That's, so that's the first reason we do customer validations because we can't really trust what people told us they were going to do uh, during customer discovery. Now, there's another reason that customers lie. Maybe lie is a strong word here. Who, does anyone know who this is? Who is it? It's Edwin Land, the inventor of the instant camera, 1948. Uh, Edwin Land uh, founded the Polaroid Corporation some years earlier, earlier, dropped out of Harvard, founded the Polaroid Corporation, started selling polarized sunglasses, eventually came up with the, uh, with the instant camera. He's a very interesting guy. He's second only to Thomas Edison in terms of number of patents. Uh, Edwin Land had 535 granted US patents uh, by the time he died. And here he is, 1947, 1948, with uh, the first um, what was called initially the land camera, and then that confused people who thought they shouldn't take it near the water. Um, so it was renamed the Polaroid camera, or the Polaroid land camera it came out. Now, Edwin Land was an engineer, and he didn't believe in customer discovery or customer validation. He said, marketing is what you have to do if your, mar if your product is no good. Marketing is what you have to do if your product is no good. So he came up with this thing without talking to anybody. 1948, the, the, the people at Polaroid built 60 of these cameras. And on the day after Thanksgiving, the biggest shopping day uh, in the United States, because it's the start of Christmas season, these cameras were put on sale in Jordan Marsh, a, a, a department store in Boston. Now, as that date approached, uh, Land got something like the yips, and he started to worry about the cost. So finally, having now the cameras were being built, he started talking to prospective customers. And basically what they told him is, oh, we're not really interested. I mean, it's, all it's gonna do is save us a trip to the chemist. We can just, we'll take pictures with Phil, we'll take them to the chemist, and a, couple, a week later we'll go to the chemist and pick them up, or we'll send them off to Eastman Kodak in Rochester and they'll come back in the post. That's no problem. That, we're not, that's that's you know, not, probably not something we, we, we'd really be interested in. So Land lowered the price, and he predicted that uh, he was gonna have enough cameras to last for several weeks. So guys, I've got bad news, I've been out talking to some pr prospective customers, I don't know if we're gonna be able to sell those cameras, and we've gotta lower the price. So he lowered the price. All right, so the day after Thanksgiving came, um, the, what you see here is a scene from the Jordan Marsh department store. The, sale, the people from Polaroid had to stand up on the sales counters so that they could be seen and heard over the mob. Um, all of the cameras sold out in hours. So the supply that Land thought was gonna last for weeks and didn't have to worry about the factory was gone in a few hours and people were very happy to pay the reduced price. In fact, it was clear they would have paid not only the higher price, but an even higher price than that. So these customers weren't lying exactly to land. They were in the position of being asked about something that they'd never seen. They'd never seen, a, I mean, nobody had ever seen an instant camera before. So it was explained to them, look, you take the picture, a minute later you pull this thing out, you run through some, blah, 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 blah. and people said, well, all that's going to do for me, because they'd never had the ability to see a picture right away. They didn't know what that was going to mean. But once they saw it, as soon as they saw it, there was almost a riot in the department store. Okay? So people can't, customers can't give you good feedback about something they've never seen. And so lying may be a strong word, but maybe, but maybe not. And there's one other reason too. This is an interesting startup. This is a Dutch startup 
that uh, allows people to subscribe to a washing machine. Okay? They uh, one year ago tomorrow, 1st of October 2014, they raised 500,000 euros to get this business launched. Now the way this works is you pay a monthly subscription to the company, they bring in and install a nice washing machine. The washing machine costs about 1,200 euros. And you pay a subscription depending on how many loads you want to do. Uh, you can pay up to 22 euros or so for 35 loads. That's a lot, a lot of washing in a month. And if you go over, you pay a little half a euro extra for every, every wash over what you subscribed for. If it breaks, they'll come and fix it. There's free, free washing powder for the first year and so on. Okay, well, interesting kind of idea, I think. In a year, the company has managed to place 50 washers, 50. All right, now you say, well, wait a minute. Those people told us they wanted the damn washer. We approached them and said, you know, hey, how's, how about this for a deal? 1,200 euro washer. You subscribe to it for, 20, for 24 euros a month. Uh, we install a little plug that monitors your usage and sends the data to the cloud and lets us know if the washer's performing all right. So for, in a year, 50 people have actually followed through on what they said they would do, which is take the washer, okay? Now, that's a, a stark enough difference to what they planned that people actually went out and talked to people who said they were gonna have the washer and didn't. And there's a, there's a couple of reasons for this, but the, a predominant reason among people who can't afford to buy a washing machine but could afford 24 euros a month to get their clothes washed. In fact, they were spending that at the laundromat already. Responded by saying, when I, when I took the survey, and this is key, when I took the survey, I was in survey taking mode, and I said, yes, that's a very rational thing to do. When it actually came down to it, I realized if I have that washing machine in my house, every single time I see it, I'm gonna remember that I can't afford a washing machine. I can't afford to buy a washing machine. So I don't want that in my house. I'll keep going to the laundromat. It doesn't make me feel bad, okay? Now I tell that story for a couple of reasons. One is customers lie. Right? They, 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 they don't act the way they said they were going to act. They especially do that with surveys, especially. I don't know about all of you, my students at Monash are very, very quick to use SurveyMonkey. Uh, they seem to be able to interact with people over Facebook only. Uh, they can't look somebody in the eye, they're looking down at their at their phone. They, they want to send out lots of surveys. Some marketing lecturer somewhere has filled them with this idea that if they can only get enough numbers into a spreadsheet, um, they, they can come up with a startup, even if the numbers are completely fanciful. So I, I tell the story for two reasons. One is to emphasize the theme of customers lie. That's why we've got to do validation. And secondly, customers on surveys especially lie because they're in a different psychological frame. They're filling out a survey, they're in an analytical mode. Yes, that would, economic, economically that makes sense. When it's time to buy it, they say psychologically it doesn't make sense. I don't want that thing, I don't want to be reminded every time I look at it, okay? So what do we do about it? Well, we do customer validation. And customer validation in this framework consists of five steps, four steps really. Get ready to sell, sell, position, verify, and then either scale or pivot. So get ready to sell, sell, position, verify, scale, or pivot. I, I'll just talk about each one of these now, okay? Get ready to sell. You've gotta be prepared to sell, obviously, before you go out to start selling. You need, at a minimum, a high fidelity minimum viable product that is something that actually works, actually produces the, the outcome that you're trying to uh, produce. You need a price list, you need Sales collateral, they need a brochure or a landing page or something that you, you, know, you can leave with the customer. You need to be able to collect money, okay? And you need metrics. You should have the metrics in place before you start to sell because you're gonna use those metrics to track the sales process. And there's, two, there's these two models, you all know Dave McClure, pirate metrics, Ah, Okay? Or Steve Blank, get, keep, grow. It's the same framework, basically. They just divide the world up a little differently. You need to have these things. Before you, before, you, before you can sell, you, you, and probably more, but at least these things. Now let's do a couple of examples of this, getting ready to sell, okay? Um, here's an example, this is a map company, VenueMob, full disclosure, I'm an investor in this company. Um, VenueMob was founded by a team of students, one of whom was in my course at Monash before he dropped out, and uh, 
with, uh, with two other people founded a group buying company called Crowdmass, which after a year was sold to Groupon. Um, the, the three founders um, with that group buying company aimed at university students had spent a lot of time talking to bars and restaurants. And the bars and restaurants said generally, sure, sure, we'll sign up for group buying with university students, it's fine. But the problem we really need solved is to get more groups. We want more parties, we want more events, we want more corporate functions, that's what we want, could you do that for us? And the, the founders were clever enough to file that information away. When the company, first company was bought, they served out their duty with the acquirer Groupon. When that uh, obligation expired, they left and started Venue Mob. Okay? Now, now what a, you know, so what Venue Mob does now, very nice website, allows you to search for a venue for a 21st birthday party, for a hen's party, for a wedding, whatever, whatever. What they started with, though, wasn't anything like this. They had two key hypotheses that they wanted to validate. Now, remember they'd done already customer development, customer discovery, excuse me, while they were talking to people uh, when they were in the group buying mode. So they had a pretty good idea that the customers said they were interested in this. Were they really interested? Two key hypotheses. One, would they pay? Would restaurants and bars actually pay for a referral to, uh, to an event? And two, would the person who's trying to book the event be willing to wait a little bit before the request was granted? Venue booking can't work the way hotel room booking and airplane flight booking and rental car booking and so on works. In those cases, uh, the plane is the plane, the car is the car, the room is the room, but a venue is not a venue. Venues can be reconfigured. Uh, chairs can be moved, tables can be moved, walls can be opened and closed. Uh, the uh, manager needs to be able to uh, look at the request and decide whether any of that can be done. In addition, many, many venues have no electronic system recording uh, bookings. It's not, they're not like airlines. They're not like rental car companies or hotels. They're, they're small. They may have only a whiteboard. They may have only a, a, a book that lists what's going on in the, in the venue. There's nothing to hook into electronically. So the second hypothesis was people making the booking would be willing to wait a little bit before they heard about it, okay? Uh, they built a very, very simple landing page uh, which employed a thing called the venue bot. And they said, if you're, act if you're interested in a, in a, uh, a booking, uh, enter the details into the venue bot and press the, whip, press the uh, button and the venue bot will get back to you. Well, of course, there wasn't any venue bot. There were the three uh, founders sitting around in a room. When, it, when a request came in, they'd scramble around, get on the phone, they'd look on Google, they'd, they'd come, and they'd, then they'd send a message back from the venue bot. We think that you'd like to go, da, 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 right? And people, people went for it, all right? People went for it. So they, they tested those two hypotheses, and they were both correct. They were on, they were on safe ground to go out and actually start uh, building this company. But that test was really important. That test was really important. Um, all right, another example. That's, this is a digital company. What about a physical company? Here's a, a company uh, called El Alamo, uh, founded by two Monash MBA students, one from Argentina, one from Italy. The Argentinian in Melbourne misses empanadas. These are empanadas here, the national street food of Argentina. He observed there were no empanada uh, uh, places in Melbourne and set out to uh, create one. One of his lecturers said what he needed was a business plan. And so he created a very, very elaborate spreadsheet with many, many details in it. Uh, then the lecturer, I guess he didn't want to read that. He directed the students to me. I'm going to take a little bit of credit for this, by the way, folks. Um, uh, he directed the students to me. I met with the students. They said, um, we need $140,000 to build a restaurant. We're gonna rent a space, we're gonna kit it out, we're gonna turn it into a restaurant, and we're gonna start selling empanadas, okay? So I said, well, look guys, first of all, I left my wallet at home, so I you know, can't, can't give you $140,000, but frankly, I wouldn't give you a dollar, because you haven't, can, you haven't ever sold a single empanada. And they said, oh, no, no, we have, we have. We've done some catering, so we've got good recipes, we know we can make empanadas in bulk, and people love them. 
And then the Argentinian government had a wine festival and we went there. Then there was a music festival and we went there. I said, okay, good, you're, you're moving down the track. But you haven't sold a single empanada to a person who behaves the way you think your customers will behave. And you wanna spend $140,000 building a restaurant. They were not ready to sell, in my opinion. And it would have been easy to sink $140,000 into a restaurant and not achieve their goals. Now, what I, what I nudged them to do was in the first place on the left, a pop-up shop. This is a pop-up shop outside the Paran market. They rented it very cheaply. They have very um, simple equipment in there. Those are the two guys. They rent it themselves. Uh, they hired an attractive young woman to stand out on the sidewalk and hand out brochures about the empanadas. Uh, they opened and they discovered that people indeed walking past would come in and get the empanadas. But, but, they didn't behave like Argentinians. Argentinians apparently view empanadas as a takeout food, a takeaway food, like pizza, what you would think of pizza. That, that isn't the way Australians behaved in Paran. They came in, bought empanadas, they wanted to sit down. He said, okay, we've got to know where do we sit? Sit. Yes, yeah, sit. We want to sit. Oh, all right, okay, well, our, okay, okay. So tables and chairs appeared. The next thing they, they you know, they said, we'd like some salad with our empanadas. Okay, so, all right, so now we're, now we're gonna sell some salad. The third thing, they, in this way, they do behave, we do behave like Argentinians, they wanted beer. They said, all right, we're fine, okay, here we go. So they, they got all that happening, nice, nice uh, business started up, uh, a place opened up in Paran, a market itself, and um, there they are with their shop. Next month, October, they're gonna open, finally, their restaurant in Richmond. But if they, had built that, if they had built that restaurant two years ago, when they showed up with a spreadsheet, they would, not have, um, they would not have been able to get a very good return on their investment because they didn't understand the customer behavior, uh, they didn't understand what the customer wanted along with the empanadas, and so on. There's no way to understand that. I mean, you, you can go out in the street and talk to people who've never had an empanada and say, hey, when you want that empanada, do you want to stand, stand up or sit down? Or would you like a salad with that? What? They've never tasted the food. They can't answer that question. So getting ready to sell in this case, what, and it's a, physical, it's a physical product now, meant that they had to try in small logical steps to get themselves to the point where they understood enough. Now, by the way, they've been able to get funding at a much, much better rate now than they would have two years ago when they hadn't sold a single empanada, okay? So getting ready to sell in this case means little, little steps to build a, a, an MVP. Now, here's a, a, a maybe, a another a puzzle I'll, I'll ask you about, and you can tell me what you think we should do. Um, this is something that um, one group of students is studying engineering, is studying uh, entrepreneurship with me at Monash this semester has come up with for a startup they'd like to build. It's a cafe where you pay by the minute and everything else is free. Okay, you pay by the minute and everything else is free. And they came in and they, they, they said, hey, this is how we think it's gonna be. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we'd like to do it. So that was, that was one week. I said, oh, okay, okay. It turns out that, and I, I genuinely don't think they knew this when they made their first presentation. Two weeks later, they said, you know what we've discovered? There's a chain of these things in the UK. It's called Zieferblatt. Zieferblatt is sort of the German word for clock face. And the way this thing works, the way this thing works is you come in and you take a, a, an alarm clock, and uh, you sit down and you pay in Europe, in, in the UK, sorry, six pence a minute. You can stay as long as you want. Self-service coffee and tea, biscuits, fruit, so on. Um, you can have as much as you want, stay as long as you want. You don't pay for what you eat or drink, you pay for how long you've been there. So this, and, it, and it's going, there's 18 of these things. So now the students said, okay, gee, we've been around talking to people at Monash University and they all tell us they'd kind of like to have a place like this. You know, we figure it's gonna cost thirty or $40,000 to kit it out. I said, uh, customer validation, guys, customer validation. Now, now what? How do, we, how do we validate an idea like this? Okay, just, I'll plant that with you, we'll come, we'll, and we'll, maybe we'll come back to it in Q&A. It's not so easy because in this case, you sort of have to build the whole thing. I mean, if you build, if you build a little one for not much money, maybe that's not really testing the idea, right? So, so I'll, I'll leave that with you. Ch a, bit of, a bit of a challenge here for an inch, what could be an interesting idea. Okay, now you're gonna sell. You really get out there and sell, right? 
Uh, you, you, this is a horrible word coined by Steve Blank, early evangelists. These are crazy people um, generally, and there aren't very many of them, but you don't need very many. You just want them to validate your product, give you some feedback, and pay you a little bit of money. Okay, how do you find those people? Um, well, here's something that a group of students uh, that I was teaching at Monash a few years ago uh, did. They um, wanted to put together a company that was going to provide taxi cab transportation or taxi cab like transportation for kids. They called it uh, kid cabs and they worked really hard on it. Um, they uh, went to an uh, elementary school near Monash. They stood outside uh, as the mothers drove up with their cars, were blocked in traffic. They would go and offer them a brochure. Okay. Several mothers said, how, could, could I just leave the car with you and the kids and I'll go off to work and you take the car and drive the kids. Never met these guys before, but honestly, you know, <laughs> I said, yeah, you know, they were work life balance for those women meant more time to work. And they, if somebody else would take the kids and the car, you know, bring both of them back at the end of the day, but you know, off they would go, right? But more interesting than that was, was well, people who responded by saying, well, I'm not actually the mother, I'm the nanny or I'm not the mother of all these kids, we do a carpool in our, in our area, and so on. Now, they've learned a lot from that interaction with people, okay, and they actually got to the point of starting to sell. Now, the term ended, they didn't really progress the idea, but we did go to a business planning competition in Adelaide, which the students won. That's me on the left in a much younger version. The interesting thing about this photo is, when we got the photo, I said to the students, hey, who's that woman? They said, what you, we thought you knew her. I said, no, I have no idea who that woman is. So as far as, as far as I can tell, some woman took, saw four young studs and an old guy and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in the photos. Anyway, okay. so they were out there finding early evangelists, essentially. Crazy mothers who'd say, take the car and the kids, see you tonight. And people who said, well, I'm the, I'm the nanny. I'm the, I'm the, you know, it's my week in the, in the barrel to drive all the kids in the neighborhood here. That was an interesting selling proposition. So early evangelists, OK? Now, another thing that's in, it's kind of important thing to have is an archetype or a persona, a vision of who you're trying to sell to. Who is it? All right? And you need to be able to separate users and payers. It's very important to understand, is the person who's going to use your product the person who's going to pay for your product or not? And especially in B2B situations, the user and the payer are often quite different, often quite different people. Okay? So here's a persona that one of another group of students at Monash is using. Um, they have another food idea uh, for Peruvian food. This is a fictional person who has the characteristics of, that they think typifies their customer base. It's important to have one of these when you're looking for early, for two reasons, when you're looking for the early sales. One is, it reminds the team over and over and over again that they are not the customer. They may be in love with the product, but they are not the customer. Wilson is the customer. And Wilson has these characteristics. He wants to eat, he wants to eat healthy. He wants to practice sports. He wants to have food inside the campus, et cetera, et cetera. You notice the development of the pains and gains thing going on at the bottom here, thinking about what, what, what does Wilson really want from the product. So I, I encourage the students always to have a persona or more than one persona or an archetype, a fictional character who has the characteristics that they believe are uh, generally true about their, their initial target customers. It's very helpful in developing the product and in keeping the team focused on the customer, not on themselves. Okay, now position. Two things have to be positioned eventually. I'm putting this here because it's tempting to do more of this than I think is, strictly speaking, necessary at this stage. You have to decide, how, is your, how are you going to position your product? Is it expensive? Is it, are you going to position it as an expensive product or an inexpensive product, as a luxury product or an everyday product, as a useful product or a nice-to-have product, et cetera, et cetera? What's the positioning that you're going to adopt? And you're going to have to position your company. And of course, we all know how we do that. Uh, there's everybody else, and there's our company up there at the upper right-hand side. Uh, now, it's tempting, as I said, I think, to do more of this than is really appropriate at this point. You have to be thinking about it, but you don't want to, you don't want to decide necessarily firmly on a positioning until you're absolutely sure of the business model. And remember that what's going on here is the, the business model is being 
uh, validated in this whole process. We call, it, we call it customer validation, but really it's validation of the entire business model, including the customer segments, and of the sales process. So positioning, and finally, here, verify, repeat, scale, pivot, what is it you're going to do? A couple, a couple of phrases here that come to mind. Clayton Christensen says, startups should be greedy for profit and patient for growth. Greedy for profit and patient for growth, meaning make sure that the business model is actually working before you try to repeat it somewhere else. Because if it's broken and you repeat it somewhere else, now you've got two problems on your hand, on your hands. Okay, so get it, get it right, uh, and then and then think about scaling. Another phrase here is nail it, then scale it. Um, the same, it's exactly the same principle. Make sure that the business model is working before you decide to expand it somewhere else. Don't pour a lot of money into scaling. Don't hire the sales team. Don't do any of those things until you're absolutely sure that the, you're as sure as you can be. And how would you know? Well, I, let me skip the Coca and LTV thing for a second. Uh, some people say, uh, <coughs> Ask your customers on a scale of one to 10 to rate you. Dave McClure says he always wants to see a six or a seven on average before he's willing to, to allow a startup to scale. Another question you can ask is, would you be disappointed if we disappeared? Or how disappointed would you be if we disappeared? And you'd like sort of half the customers to say, oh, we'd be devastated, or words to that effect. If they said, you mean you haven't already disappeared or something like that, uh, that's a bad sign. The other thing you should be doing at this stage is making absolutely sure that the cost of customer acquisition is much, much less than the uh, lifetime value of a customer. So you want the cost, cost of customer acquisition to be much, much less than the lifetime value. Um, these are estimates at this point, but as you work through the validation process, your estimates should become more refined. Your estimates should become more refined. Um, Groupon, just to come back to them for a second, as you may know, is having some trouble lately. They had big layoffs and thinking about their business model. I suspect what's happened with them as more and more group buying companies have come on the scene is both that the cost of customer acquisition has gone up because there's more competition and the lifetime value of the customer has gone down because there's more choice for the customer. So those things are both working, they're working in the wrong direction. You, you want the cost to go down and the value to go up. I, I, just a supposition. You don't have to test your idea on the whole world. You don't have, the whole world is not your customer. Well, definitely not your customer, right? You don't have to test. So uh, pick out who you need to test it on and test it. And then, and we'll come back to this initial slide, okay? I just wanna point out to you that at the, at the right-hand side of the customer validation uh, circle, there's a stop sign. Uh, you may not go any further than this. It may be that you get, to, you get into customer validation and you say, you know what, this isn't gonna work. You know, the customers told us X, but they're not going to do it. We can't get them uh, to, to commit to doing what they said they were going to do. There's also a pivot, an iteration line back to customer discovery. But if everything goes well and you decide that you've got a scalable, repeatable business model, you've validated that, then you're ready to move across the line into execution. You've stopped being a startup. You've become a real company. You've stopped searching for a business model. You started executing on the business model. And you, that is the place where, as Steve Blank says, you, sh you should scale like there's no tomorrow. Or maybe it's Bill Ouellette that says that, but anyway, someone says it. Uh, scale like there's, like there's no tomorrow. 